Good evening, everybody. What I'd like to do tonight is not just simply uh, talk about tolerance, but talk about some of the issues that lay behind it. Because very often when we talk about tolerance, what we talk about is something very, very different. Uh, what we talk about often is more fundamental human issues to do with the exercise of moral independence. It's to do with the capacity of trusting individuals to make responsible decisions. There's a very interesting concept that uh, is often used in European politics, public life. And that concept is zero tolerance. I don't know if you've got a concept of zero tolerance in Dutch language. Well, zero tolerance is interesting because there's an assumption that by abolishing tolerance, you're doing something really good. It's a, it's a positive, defined gesture. Zero tolerance, I mean business. I'm, I'm really you know, doing something good for the society. So there's an assumption behind it that tolerance is not really a good thing. That tolerance is, is probably <coughs> something that we should just abolish, at least in relation to that specific issue. But when you actually look at what zero tolerance means, when you sort of culturally unpack zero tolerance, what it really means is zero discretion. Zero discretion, it means that I really do not want you to use your own judgment and to arrive at your own conclusion in your own way because that's far too dangerous. That's why we say zero tolerance, it's black and white. There's only one answer, there's only one truth, and that's the end of the discussion. Zero tolerance means zero risk, zero discretion, and that's, that's all there is to it. I think it's a very important concept that we worship and we celebrate the idea of zero, of zero tolerance in that kind of a way. Because in a sense, when we talk about zero tolerance, we actually are saying nothing else than the fact that I'm sparing you of the responsibility of using your own individual autonomy to arrive at the truth in your own manner. That's what zero tolerance means. I take responsibility for you and for everybody else in society in terms of making that kind of decision. And one of the conclusions that I've come to when I looked at uh, the reason why tolerance in our society is so rarely celebrated, why people spend so much time uh, sort of trying to find arguments for limiting tolerance is because what lies behind tolerance, what gives tolerance its incredibly radical, creative, transformative dimension, is that it celebrates the act of individual judgment. Right? To be tolerant and to uphold tolerance is to say that we like we expect that people making decisions on the basis of their own judgment is really the best way forward within society. So the point I want to emphasize in this talk tonight is that as a virtue, tolerance is closely linked to affirming the freedom of independent judgment. That's really uh, what's important. And I want to suggest <coughs> it's our belief in the value of independent judgment of human beings as judgment-making, truth-seeking individuals, so I'll also faith in that, that is so closely tied to the cavalier way in which we regard freedom and tolerance. See, behind every belief, every expression of individual conscience is the assumption that this is an act of judgment. When liberal philosophy develops and begins to uphold the value of tolerance, it does so in part because we think that individual conscious ought to find a way of expression, expressing itself and that individual judgment as a way of seeking the truth is unbound, something that should be supported, even protected, rather than attacked. And if you look at human history, you could say that throughout the last two, three thousand years, we as a, as a society have always had trouble with judgment. It's not something that we felt comfortable with. I mean, today, for example, we don't trust teachers in schools to make their own judgment calls. We give them a curriculum. In England, 
We literally tell them every day, this is what you teach. <coughs> and you stick to the curriculum or you're in trouble. We'd rather have rules and regulations that tell people how to act on their profession than to believe or trust their capacity for discretion and judgment. It hasn't always been like that. I think if you look at, for example, Aristotle, one of the exciting things I find about Aristotle when I was working on my new book is the way that Aristotle, when he was looking at the different kind of virtues that uh, he considered as being important for our attention, one of the principal virtues that he said was the most important virtue of all, that underpinned all the other virtues, was that of what he calls phronesis, which basically means, I suppose for lack of easy translation, the capacity to judge. It's really about being able to judge, using your discretion in relation to certain uh, sort of dilemmas that we face as a people. And in Aristotle's case, he understood that from a philosophical perspective, being able to judge, being, feeling free to judge, daring to judge, was a really important step in the creation of a proper public kind of political life. Very much anticipating some of the arguments that Hannah Arendt will make centuries later on. As we go down in history, we find that that issue of judgment is not something that we always celebrate. So, for example, in the writing of Thomas Hobbes, the English father of liberalism, or maybe, uh, if not the father of liberalism, at least an, an important influence on it, you will find that in the case of Thomas Hobbes, judgment, people making judgments and acting on their judgment, is seen as the cause of the English Civil War. And he basically says, you know, one of the things that we've got to really worry about is that since the Reformation, as people become more aware of their individual conscience, they feel that they have the right to make their own judgment instead of listening to the supreme authority. And Hobbes says that one of the things that we have got to do is to sit on it, is to ensure that instead of individuals acting on the basis of their independent judgment, this is something that is kind of congealed together. And it's really only since the time of Spinoza in this country or Locke in, in England, that attitudes towards tolerance begin to change quite dramatically, to the point at which, at least on paper, we all think that tolerance is a good thing, on paper. Europeans think that tolerance is a really positive thing, rhetorically. But what I want to suggest to you is that we have a very big puzzle in European society. And the big puzzle, or to put it better, an irresolvable contradiction in our way of thinking is that the rhetorical affirmation of tolerance coexists side by side with the cultural celebration of non-judgmentalism. To go hand in hand, and I know this because very often when I talk to children, they come back from school and they learned about citizenship or they learned about values, and I ask them, well, you know, what does it mean to be European? What kind of values did you learn? And immediately they will say, we learn that it's important to be tolerant and non-judgmental. We learn that. And when I try to explain to them that actually the two are contradictory, that you cannot be tolerant unless you prepare to judge, that without judgment, tolerance is empty of any kind of content, then I realize that I've got a big debate on my hand. And maybe I should wait until they become 14 or 15, because uh, that's the time when they have these arguments uh, in a proper kind of a way. So it's important to realize that when we have a situation, as we do in Europe, where every mission statement says, we are a tolerant society, we are non-judgmental, we respect everything, we don't criticize, blah, blah, blah. When you have that, what you have is a situation where tolerance has been emptied of meaning, and not infrequently, when tolerance becomes emptied of meaning, it, eas it easily is the situation where tolerance mutates into intolerance. So we have this interesting uh, pattern in Europe where you begin with tolerance, but it's a tolerance that's not meant to be judgmental. It's meant to be a tolerance that ever so nice and ever uncritical, 
And you wake up next morning and you realize that the people that argued for tolerance on Monday, by Tuesday are rehearsing a speech on the virtues of zero tolerance. And how could that be? How, could, how do you get from one to the other in, in that kind of a way? How does that actually occur? That's really what I'm really uh, sort of fascinated by, that whole kind of process. Now, it seems to me that if you actually look at Europe today, one of the things that I do is, uh, unlike you people, who on a Saturday night go to parties, they, you go to the bar, you have a nice social life. I haven't got a social life. I sit at home and I look at documents. I look at mission statements and I read them to see what they mean. But one thing I love doing is looking at EU documents. Somewhat, there's a guy in Brussels who writes these documents for everybody. It's the same, uses the same word, the same language. It doesn't matter what kind of organization it is. It's always the same banalities that are kind of being put forward. And in these EU documents, uh, and they usually go on about tolerance, because tolerance usually comes in at number six, after <coughs> diversity, you know, after respect, after raising self-esteem, you know, tolerance is always somewhere in there. In, in these documents, uh, tolerance is often described as, de as a desirable character trait. You know, a nice person is tolerant. You know, somebody, you know, gives you a big hug. <coughs> is tolerance. It's a, it's a kind of a pleasant character trait. Uh, that's the way it's presented. Rather than as a way of responding to beliefs with which you disagree. Uh, because tolerance is really not about saying, hi, I love you. Tolerance is to say, I really disagree with you. But nevertheless, I support your right to express those kinds of views. And indeed, if you look at school textbooks, and that's quite a good marker of this. In school textbooks in Europe, tolerance is almost invariably synonymous with non-judgmentalism. The two are seen as being the same. Non-judgmental and tolerant are pretty much seen as being the same thing. So what I argue in the book that I've written is that instead of seeing tolerance as a way of responding to different views, different standpoints, tolerance has become a way of not taking them seriously. Because if all you do is just accept them uncritically, if all you do is not judge another person as you, that's another way of saying, I'm not that interested, not, not that bothered by what you're going to say. And therefore, I argue is that when tolerance is represented as a form of detached indifference or as a gesture connoting mechanical acceptance, it becomes a vice rather than a virtue. There's nothing intrinsically good about that. Of course, if you understand the meaning of tolerance in the way that it evolved historically, tolerance always involves an act of judgment. According to the classical liberal outlook, tolerance involves an act of judgment and of discrimination. But judgment is not offered in order to censor other people. It doesn't act as a prelude to censorship. You don't say that just because I judged you were wrong, I'm going to, in any way, ban somebody's erroneous opinion. What tolerance does is it demands not respect for the person, in the way that it's often put forward today. It demands respect for people's right to hold beliefs in accordance with their own conscience. What tolerance does is it claims the moral high ground by saying, that even though what you say is wrong, nevertheless, it's far more important that you express that, you act in accordance with your conscience, <coughs> than in some shape or form, your views should be suppressed or brand. And therefore, from this standpoint, tolerance uh, becomes a, a very small, a very important price that we pay for allowing uh, people to express that point of view. The, the way that it works is that we actually believe that through giving people an opportunity to express their views, including their erroneous views, all of us throughout society benefit from that. That society, <coughs> communities culturally flourish, culturally develop, and intellectually move forward through the interplay of conflicting opinions. 
Now, it's important to realize that in the 21st century, non-judgmentalism is often represented as an enlightened, liberal point of view. But it's really nothing of the sort. Obviously, unreflected judgments, judgments that are not based upon reflection, uh, judgments which are based on stereotyping, are quite often based on nothing more than conformist prejudice. And they have no necessarily inherent virtues. But at the same time, just because opinions that are expressed so freely have got no merit, doesn't mean that the opposite which is non-judgmentalism, uh, should possess any particular ethical kind of qualities. You see, the question that we have to ask is why people refuse to judge? Why do we celebrate non-judgmentalism? What's positive about non-judgmentalism? And it seems to me that quite often the reluctance to judge is a symptom either of disinterest I'm just not interested in what you're going to say. And you get that in the American context where you often have arguments. And the argument ends by somebody saying, whatever. <laughs> whatever. You know, sort of. So it either means disinterest or it means even moral cowardice. That you are too cowardly, intellectually and morally, to take up a point of view that you might seem as dangerous or powerful, or difficult to handle, difficult to manage. And in current times, I would suggest, it's often brought about by a reluctance to confront difficult and embarrassing questions. Not questioning other people's beliefs and opinions actually closes the door to the elaboration of a mutually agreed consensus. And that's a very troubling uh, sort of development. I quite often find it very troubling when people tell me, you cannot debate with those people. What's the point of debating with these jihadists? You know, they're closed-minded. Essentially what you're saying is they're closed-minded, and therefore we'll take them as our model, and we'll be equally closed-minded by shutting down discussion. Or people say, what's the point of talking to those right-wing populists? You know, they're just demagogues. All they do is they, they kind of prey on people's fears. Well, actually what you're saying is that I do not feel confident enough to have the intellectual and the rhetorical power to be able to confront those arguments. And it's far more persuasive for me to hide behind legal measures and bureaucratic instruments to censor other people's view, to pretend they don't exist, to kind of match them away, than to actually, in a creative way, judge them in public as being wrong. <coughs> it's also the case that 21st century Western society is so uncomfortable with making value judgments <coughs> that it's developed an entire vocabulary of euphemisms to avoid being unambiguous, clear, and blunt in statements. Politicians, when you listen to them, how many times do you hear politicians say, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong, this is evil? How many times do you hear, what you hear them say is not, please support this policy, because this is just, this is the truth. What they will say is that research shows that, or according to the evidence, is anything other than making a clear act of judgment in public, of making a, a judgment of, of value. And this trend is particularly strong in schooling and education, where there's a veritable Orwellian vocabulary that has emerged that provides teachers and others with avoiding making judgments about children. So in the English-speaking world, we describe children as having special needs. Interesting, uh, special needs. I mean, who doesn't have special needs? You know, sort of, right? I can give you a long list of my special needs, you know, so if you want to hear them. But we talk about children as being hard to reach children. You know, we, you know the other day my son came home, you know, and, and, and I remember he said to me, why is it that we call 
stupid children gifted. <laughs> yeah, why call them gifted? Couldn't uh, understand that particular use. Because actually, those are gifted men, you know, intelligent and bright and whatever. And there's this incredible list of words that we use that avoids teachers having to make what are accurate, clear, concise statements <coughs> that kind of capture the situation. So we kind of hide behind words. One of the nice things about Hannah Arendt, uh, in her discussion of the world, is she had a, a tremendous amount of intellectual and moral integrity. I was quite often prepared to say very unpopular uh, sort of statements. And what I love about Hannah Arendt is that quite often she was prepared to put herself on the line and to make judgments uh, that are actually you know, sort of likely to provoke and invite negative reactions. And one of the things that uh, she said that, that I think is quite important is that she talked about judgment. And she basically said that the reluctance of judgment, the fear of judging, was an expression of a disinclination towards public association. And she writes of the blind obstinacy that becomes manifest in the lack of imagination and failure to judge. In other words, what she's really getting at is that non-judging isn't just being polite, <coughs> the way that uh, it's often presented today. Not judging isn't just a, a small character flaw. Non-judgmentalism is a serious cultural defect. It basically represents not only a lack of imagination, but it also represents a disruption of the organic process through which clarification and intellectual insights are gained. And you see, from a humanist, a liberal humanist perspective, judgment is not simply an acceptable response to other people's beliefs and behavior. It is actually a public duty. It is our public duty to judge and to express that. It is only... <coughs> as Hannah Arendt and other humanists have suggested, it is only through an act of judgment that a dialogue is established between individuals and groups within society. Unless we, do, unless we judge, we don't communicate our ideas, our opinions. There's no basis for a dialogue, and there's certainly no basis for a debate without such judgment. And drawing on Kant's critique of judgment, Hannah Arendt writes with a large way of thinking, which as judgment knows how to transcend its own individual limitations. That's Hannah Arendt. Roll the film forward to the 21st century, and according to intellectual currents in Europe, according to the convention of our times, the act of judging confines the imagination and encourages narrow-mindedness. How many times have you heard judgmentalism, as it's called, judgmentalism, being equated with being narrow-minded? How can you judge other people's view? Aren't you being narrow-minded? That's the way that it's kind of represented today. But in fact, to be truly open-minded, open to new opportunities, to yield to new experience, you do it via the root of judging. And in fact, as Arendt contends, judging plays a central role in disclosing to individuals the nature of their public world. Judging, as she says, is one, if not the most important activity in which the sharing the world with others come to pass. It is through judgment that we share ideas and consolidate and develop a common experience. A judgment does not simply dismiss another person's views. It's not about simply saying, oh, that's wrong. Not something I think is, is important. The power of judgment rests on a potential agreement with others. In making a judgment and in me disclosing my judgment to you, even if it's very critical, I'm also opening myself up to a response from you but also to the correction, the modification of what I have said 
And therefore, one of the reasons why true tolerance depends upon judgment is because it's a way that we move potentially from disagreement to something that brings us closer to at least understanding where each other <coughs> actually comes from. The positive potential of an act of judgment depends on the degree to which it's based on experience, reflection, and impartiality. And of course, not all judgments are of equal worth. And Arad herself argues that the quality of a judgment depends upon the degree of its impartiality. Impartiality. And of course, partial and hasty evaluations do occur. But just because sometimes we make partial and hasty judgments and evaluations is not an argument uh, against judging. It's an argument for adopting a more responsible attitude toward judgment. So why has <coughs> the creative act devalued? You know, why do we think that judgment is a bad thing? You know, why is it that these days non-judgmentalism is a virtue and judgmentalism is seen as being a negative thing. I haven't got time to go into it, but there's a number of important developments that relate to that. One of them is that the status of knowledge itself is not seen as being that important. If you don't take ideas too seriously, if you don't think that ideas really, really matter, if you don't really believe that the truth is something that's worth struggling towards, then a bit of indifference towards each other's views makes quite a lot of sense. And I often experience that, especially when I go to America in a discussion, people are so laid back, they're so chill, oh man, you know, what's the point, don't worry, you know, these are only ideas, you know, sort of roll over and, 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 and that's all there is to it. So that's, I think, one reason why, it's to do with the changing status of, the, of truth and, and knowledge. I think that uh, we also have the development of very powerful not skeptical, because I think skepticism is a good thing, but relativist currents, which basically denounce any attempt at serious judgment, any affirmation of strong beliefs as fundamentalism. The number of times I hear the word fundamentalist, essentialist used about somebody who just simply has got strong views. They quite open mind, they've got strong views, that's fundamentalism. We can forget about it in that particular kind of a way. But I think possibly the reason why judgment is, has been abolished in polite society is because of the development of very powerful therapeutic influences that signal to us the idea that people are too weak to be able to handle criticism. We have what I call the diseasing of language, the idea that you know, offensive language traumatizes. We have this belief that if children are told they're wrong too bluntly, then we commit psychic violence against them. So therefore in schools, you know, when you give them a mark, you know, you, you never tell the truth. I mean, I don't know if you've got any children, and I don't know what it's like in Hall, but every time you read a report card, you would think the child is, is Einstein. You know, <laughs> wonderful, great, you know, 20 smiley faces, you know, sort of all the rest of that. And uh, not a hint, not a hint that there's a slightest problem there. Because it's really bad for a child to be kind of criticized. And you see, well, maybe I'm a bit hard. And you could argue that they're only children, friends. You know, be nice to them, be kind, don't judge them too hard. And you may be right. But the problem is, is when the standards of criticism that we adopt towards children are exported to the world of adults, where we begin to infantilize biologically mature people and feel that you know, it's, it, it's really unkind to tell the truth. And we've got to find some pleasant way of avoiding making a judgment on them. And when we adopt a language which systematically tries not to confront people with their erroneous sentiments and their mistakes. It's when that becomes normalized, then of course, uh, sort of the free expression of sentiments through judgment becomes a problem. That is why we have a 
uh, a regime, for example, where we have this new species of hate speech. That's, you know, the argument for criminalizing what's called hate speech is not that they're bad words simply, but that hate speech is psychologically so damaging to groups in society that you know, we mustn't be allowed to hear them. So the other week, I don't know if you've probably heard about in France, they criminalized the denial of the Armenian genocide. As it happens, the French Constitutional Court said that's wrong, it's against free expression. I'm very surprised that they remember that, that it is against free expression. But it was a very interesting idea because the argument for criminalizing the denial of the Armenian genocide, the argument for, in a sense, telling people how to think about the past, that's what they say, that there's only one way you're allowed to talk about the past. There's only one history. You're not allowed to make your own judgment about what happened in Armenia. The argument is that if you question it, if you deny the genocide in Armenia, you are traumatizing and psychologically damaging the people that come from that tradition. In other words, you cause so much harm to them that it's far better to protect them from free speech than to allow the freedom of expression to occur, which is the same argument about hate speech. All these new laws about you know, not, being, not being able to say, de denying this or saying that, is all based on the idea that speech is now so toxic, so dangerous, that we cannot possibly allow. And the reason why it's so dangerous is because we as human beings are far too weak, far too feeble to be able to deal with critical engagement, critical judgment. And that's basically the argument that's put forward. So from this standpoint, <coughs> judgment is actually portrayed as a, as a form of psychic violence. And I could, in the book I give examples, but I can give you many examples where the act of judgment is itself stigmatized and is represented as an act of psychic violence because of its devastating impact upon somebody's future. So that's really, I think, one of the most important reasons why judgment is seen in that kind of a way. And in a sense, if we get back to the original discussion that we, that we began earlier on, that of zero tolerance, we find that zero tolerance really captures this mood because with zero tolerance, the idea that we mustn't tolerate certain opinions or certain forms of behavior, what we have is a very simple proposition. The simple proposition is, is that I have the right to decide for you how much pain, how much anguish, how much criticism, how much questioning is tolerable. And beyond that, we have zero tolerance. Beyond that, we have zero tolerance because we're not allowing you to make up your own mind as to what it is that's acceptable for you in that particular case. Now, of course, zero tolerance and, and zero discretion is an interesting idea because in the denial of judgment, in the abolishing of judgment, and certainly in undermining the cultural valuation for it, what we're actually doing is questioning the very meaning of freedom. See, freedom is many things, and we can have our different interpretations of what freedom is. But the one thing that we all know that freedom represents, as does judge, freedom is very risky. Freedom doesn't come with guarantees. Freedom and the freedom of speech often leads to discussions where you don't know what's going to end up. You have no idea where this debate will eventually lead to. When we have arguments and conversations and dialogues in the public sphere, one of the risks that we take is that we don't know which side will prevail. We ultimately don't know how will society come to an agreement. It's all a very, very risky kind of phenomenon. Risk, in this sense, the uncertainty that's associated with freedom 
is something that we all find really, really uncomfortable. It's something not quite right about it, which is one of the things that we've continually sort of uh, dealing with. And one of the, the conclusions that I've come to is that actually there is a very close connection between the erosion of judgment, the questioning of tolerance, and European societies' aversion to risk. And that connection has got to do with how we think about uncertainty. How do we deal with uncertainty, the uncertain world that we live in? Do we try to regulate uncertainty out of existence, which is what government regulation does, which is what zero tolerance policies do, we just basically get rid of uncertainty, because it's, it's either this or that. Or do we acknowledge that uncertainty is something we need to engage with, sometimes even engage with positively, not something that we need to fear, but something that we need to make work for us. And I think that's ultimately the question that Europe needs to face. Because if you look at human history, you will find that the times in history when freedom flourishes, when tolerance comes to the fore, is also the time when people take uncertainty and embrace it. It's a time when people become much more open to the idea of taking risks. You know, when is liberty taken seriously? But what kind of people? In what kind of circumstances? It was first of all in ancient Athens, the cradle of democracy, that risk-taking acquired a positive cultural valuation. Athens and the Greeks regarded risk-taking and freedom as mutually reinforcing values. A similar trend is discernible in the life of the Italian city-states during the Renaissance, where the development of early ideas of a liberty were paralleled by a disposition towards experimentation, exploration, and risk-taking. To this day, the First Amendment of the American Constitution affords greater protection to the freedom of speech than is available in Europe. And historically, the widening of the interpretation of the First Amendment was inextricably bound up with a robust attitude towards risk-taking. When Spinoza or Locke actually argued for toleration, they took a big risk. I mean, imagine saying that toleration was a good thing. Because up to that point, the virtue in Europe wasn't toleration, but intoleration. To be intolerant was seen as a religious virtue by most of the Christian churches up to that time. To then come along and say, let's be tolerant, is really taking a very big risk. And I think that risk-taking element was really well summed up by the Supreme Court jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who actually played a, a very important role in the progressive uh, sort of interpretation of the First Amendment, who argued that the American Constitution obliged citizens to an experiment, use the word to an experiment, based on the premise that the best test of the truth in the power, is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. And I think what Holmes's analogy of an experiment does is it captures the uncertain, open-ended trajectory of the pursuit of freedom. What happens when society becomes hesitant, awkward, estranged from taking risks, when it finds uncertainty <coughs> extremely uncomfortable to deal with? I think what happens under those circumstances is that its capacity to judge and to tolerate diminishes. <coughs> it's something that we do in, the, in private, amongst friends. But what has happened is not only have we become reluctant and estranged from being truly tolerant, with the passing of time, we also become less and less prepared to uphold tolerance itself as a virtue, and instead are slowly giving way to accepting intolerance as an acceptable mode of dealing with problems. 
in difficult situations. So we begin by developing a very pragmatic attitude towards tolerance. We kind of give up on judging on Monday. On Tuesday, we still write in our mission statements that we Europeans are very tolerant. On Wednesday, somebody said, well, Professor Ferredi, how can you tolerate intolerance? And a day later they say, the way you deal with intolerance is by being intolerant. That's the way you deal with it. In other words, the way you deal with intolerance is by adopting the moral standpoint of the intolerant yourself. And I think that's the logical dynamic that operates in European societies, and that's something that we, as a democratically-minded public, interested in open society, got every interest in countering and fighting. Thank you. for your speech, which I think is a very strong argument, uh, the devil's advocate for, for a while. Um, you present real tolerance as the opposition of um, indifferent tolerance, um, a more uh, live and let live attitude. Um, however, your ideal of real tolerance uh, seems okay and even appropriate to a setting of responsible citizens discussing and debating the issues of the day um, and ultimately perhaps reaching a higher level of insight. But in truth, much of what we call public debate is not about convincing other people, it's about um, uttering hate speech, about um, uh, humiliating other people, about insulting them, um, and it doesn't serve any purpose in the in a, in a public debate way. Don't you feel that your real tolerance is a bit of a luxury in the real public debate as it takes place in our society? Well, I think that sometimes uh, we are confronted with arguments that, as you say, are insubstantial their rhetorical gestures, their uh, empty insults, uh, they're simply designed to cause pain rather than to convince. And at that point, we have one of two options. We can either say, you know, this is not the game that I'm playing, and, and therefore go home, and uh, argue only against people that are as intelligent and eloquent as I am, which I think is a cop-out, is an excuse. Or alternatively, what you do is you find a way of either demonstrating to those people how arguments should be conducted by raising the standard of discussion, by your, through your judgment of them, and to the power of your arguments embarrassing them, exposing what they're doing to the rest of the public. Or alternatively what you do is you basically you know, sort of go on the offensive and, 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 and meet their rhetoric of yours and demonstrate that us intellectuals can be as good at the soundbite as they can, can be as effective as they can be. Otherwise, it becomes an act of moral cowardice to kind of simply give the, give the terrain away. Uh, to give you an example, because uh, I had this experience, a couple of weeks ago I was giving a, a seminar in, at the London School of Economics on a, on a similar subject, and there were several Dutch girls there, young women, 18, 19, 20, and they basically said to me, more or less what you're saying, but it's different, they basically said, it's all very well for you to say what you're saying, Professor Ferredi. But in Holland, we've got this problem. We have this guy, Wilders, 
and he's very charismatic. You know, he's very good at speaking. He's got a good soundbite. You know, sort of. And uh, our politicians are not very good at winning the argument with him. And they were blaming Wilders for being a very good speaker. <laughs> and also they were blaming the stupid people who believed them rather than the other side. They didn't say that we had no arguments, that we couldn't convince those people. There was no sense of self-criticism there. And it seemed to me that kind of reaction really sums up the problem because what you're saying is that uh, here, are, here, here is this guy, he's making an impact with his words. So we respond in one of two ways. Either we don't talk to him because we don't want to be embarrassed by not winning. Or alternatively, we get somebody in Brussels in the EU to pass a law, not to let him speak or something. You know, that's, that's a nice way of dealing with it. We'll, you know, we don't have to debate, we don't have to make judgments, we don't have to expose ourselves. Whereas, of course, the answer to that, you know, it, it's, it's not dishonorable to lose an argument. I've lost more arguments in my life than I had hot dinner. So nothing wrong with that. <laughs> as long as you learn from them and you come back and you argue better in the future. And so, you know, if you are worried about somebody being eloquent and charismatic, well, get, in, get, get into the saddle and, and learn, learn the, those skills yourself. But when you uh, speak about Willis, you're still speaking about a politician who tries to argue. I mean, he may argue in a way we don't like, but that's, that's not the point. But I mean, many things that are uttered, in, for instance, in the internet, are just out there to humiliate people, to uh, attack minorities, or women, or handicapped, <coughs> or Jews, or blacks, or Moroccans, or whatever. Um, it's not that anybody uh, says that specific people like, people like Wilder should shut up, but that a, a, a certain kind of speech should be um, forbidden. I mean, speech which has only the, in, the intention of insulting and causing harm. I think there's a, a danger in uh, us saying that we can decide what is good speech and what is bad speech. I mean, you and I would probably agree that a lot of that thing in the internet is horrible and degrading and humiliating and, 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 and it represents the, the worst of human civilization. But I think I would far rather that those horrible views be allowed to be expressed even though they can only have negative consequences, even though they're not going to improve our condition than to adopt an attitude where we, uh, where we develop a, a differential relationship to the right of free expression. For the very simple reason that once free expression becomes negotiable, uh, and we say that those things cannot be heard or should not be allowed to be said on the Monday, on Tuesday we'll discover other things that we find equally objectionable. And with the passing of time, Censorship will become institutionalized, and I think that's that's the problem: is that freedom, the freedom of expression, our most fundamental freedom of all, is so precious that we need to live. We, we need to pay a price for that freedom, and the price of that freedom is we've got to put up with all the stuff that you describe it. Mm. That's one of the prices we've got to pay. Yeah. You you said that um, um, much of the difficulty people have with freedom of speech is due to their they trying to avoid uncertainty. Um, but don't you feel that European history has given us good reason for um, avoiding some kinds of uncertainty? I mean, you can make a point that uh, terrible things like the, the, the Nazi rule and uh, communism in the East Bloc um, were able to exist because there was no limit to a kind of political expression. And perhaps if people have been more alert to that, that wouldn't have happened. So I can imagine that people after the war, here in Europe, have become very cautious about <laughs> insulting other people and about expressing extreme political ideas. I, I think the opposite view. I think that the problem with 
in Germany in the interwar period or in any other you know, circumstances where you have extremist totalitarian minded movements is not that there was too much freedom, but that freedom wasn't taken sufficiently seriously. And that yeah, the problem in those societies was, you know, it's, it's easier to blame the people with the extreme argument than to blame the lack of argument of the rest of society. You know, the question that I got asked in Germany, what was social democracy talking about and saying? What was the Communist Party talking about saying? What was the conservatives in Germany doing and saying? And, and they were, when you look back upon it, all often defined by their own intellectual cowardice, their reluctance to take the issues of the day sufficiently seriously. And they, they were all hoping, you know, like ostriches, that the Nazis would just go away. And they wouldn't have to lift their finger. And then, you know, these problems occur. But that's, see, the idea that somehow our freedom can be protected by limiting it is a irrational contradictory phenomenon. Whenever we limit freedom, we adopt the moral standards of the opponents of freedom. We basically signal the idea that whatever we think about freedom, we don't think it's that important to protect. And the minute we begin to say that freedom isn't that important, then we've lost the moral argument. And I think that's, that seems to be a lesson that I would draw from history. But it's a bit living dangerous. Well, I think it's far more dangerous to you to rely upon bureaucratic administrative means. I think that's a far more dangerous phenomenon because when we rely on administrative solutions, we do not confront the problem that will uh, that will get people to identify with very dangerous arguments. Let me give you an example. In in the EU, there's a law in many countries that criminalizes the denial of the Holocaust. It's very common. Germany is a good example. And the idea being that somehow if, if, if we criminalize it, then the problem will, will go away. But of course, if you actually look at what's happened since the criminalization of the denial of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism hasn't diminished anti-Semitism has anything, has anything increased. And one of the reasons, certainly in my country, where I come from in Hungary, the reason why you have really powerful, xenophobic, racist, anti-Semitic movements flourishing is because they can say, well, they're too scared to even allow us to talk about what happened in the war. You know, they, you know, what are they hiding? You know, what's the problem? And I think you know, this attempt to administratively solve the problems of the past actually creates the condition where people will draw precisely the conclusions you're trying to get them to avoid. So even in its own terms, it's stupid. Right? It doesn't work. You know, people you know, may behave childishly sometimes, but they're not children. They are, they are sensitive to the fact that there's something going on here. And I would far rather have a debate with a Holocaust denier to show the intellectual poverty and dangerousness of their argument out in the public than to kind of, you know, to put it on, on the ground, under the surface. And you're not sympathetic to the intention of the German government to spare Jews uh, the harm, psychological harm, I think, of uh, such insults? Well, obviously, obviously, it's not pleasant, you know, sort of, uh, and, and, and I never said that every speech for, for me is pleasant. A lot of these things are very painful. But I think that, uh, you know, for, uh, for Jewish people, it's far more important that the historical past is argued and clarified and not taken for granted, that every generation has got to re-argue it, rediscuss it, and convince themselves that this is right than to treat the current version of the past as a dogma that we unthinkingly accept. And one of the things that liberal uh, philosophy in the 19th century, particularly Mills, argued was that even a truth that is uncritically 
receive turns into dogma and turns into prejudice. It's far better to deal with erroneous opinion and to argue against it because that's the only way we get the clarity and the intellectual insight to deal with these 